it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. Oh, it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good afternoon and welcome to Crosstalk. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips. You are with Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. We're with you live from 1 until 3. Coming up this afternoon, the Home Secretary orders a meeting with church leaders after it's revealed a judge granted asylum to the Clapham chemical attacker Abdullah Zaidi, despite the fact he lied about his conversion to Christianity. Uh, meanwhile, is Rishi Sunak's mini reshuffle too little too late? The answer may well be a big yes, as the latest poll puts the Tories at their lowest rating since Liz Truss's disastrous foray into the country's finances. And when is a hot dog not a hot dog? Well, it's when it's a cucumber. Comedian Ed Gamble replaces the offending sausage on an advert for his forthcoming tour after tube bosses order him to withdraw it over fears it could promote obesity. All of that's coming up, but first let's get the news headlines with Nadira Tudor. Good afternoon. Rishi Sunak's pledge to stop the boats has taken a serious blow. New Home Office figures show a record number of migrants have crossed the English Channel this year. 4,644 people have made the journey so far. This is a record for the first three months of a calendar year. 338 people arrived yesterday alone. Meanwhile, there are growing concerns of an ever-growing exodus from the Conservatives after two ministers quit yesterday. Robert Halvin became the 63rd politician to say he will not stand in the next election. He was joined by the Armed Forces Minister, James Heapy, who also resigned. It triggered a mini reshuffle for Rishi Sunak. Chief political correspondent for The Times, Aubrey Allegretti, has told Talk Today that his days are numbered as the party prepares for his departure. You've got all sorts of candidates vying behind the scenes, people like Cammy Badnock, people like Grant Shapps. Uh, James Cleverley is a sort of dark horse. People don't talk about him as much, but he probably would be somebody who would go for it in the future as well. So all of that kind of manoeuvring and anticipation is already happening now. Over in Germany, at least five people have been killed in a coach crash. The Flix bus service was travelling from Berlin to Zurich on the busy A9 Autobahn when it veered to the right and fell on its side. There are reports that others were injured. The search for six missing people after the Baltimore Bridge collapse has ended. Rescuers are presuming they're all dead. The Coast Guard suspended recovery efforts following the major incident yesterday, which saw a large cargo ship collide into one of the city's main crossings. Maryland Governor Wes Moore says it will be a while before things get back to normal. This is going to be a long-term journey for our state to recover. But if there's something that I know that has been on full display today, uh, we are Maryland tough and we are Baltimore strong. And we are gonna make sure that as a state, we are gonna get through this together. We are committed to getting through it together and we will, be in, uh, we will be in consistent and constant communication with the people of the state. Public satisfaction with the NHS has hit a new record low. A new survey found just one in four people were happy with the services last year. Most said they were concerned about waiting times and staff shortages. And Katie Price says she wants to educate young women about how damaging plastic surgery can be to the body. The former model is insisting that there's nothing worse than young women getting fillers in their early 20s and says she's deferred her own children from going under the knife. That's all from us now. Here's Nazanin Gaffer with your weather. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. 
Hello. A real mixed bag of conditions out there this afternoon once again as we continue on the unsettled theme. We've seen rain across parts of the north and west this morning. As you can see on the earliest satellite and radar picture, some heavy downpours across the southwest of England and Wales. And those outbreaks of rain are continuing to move further northwards, breaking up into showers as they do. Some more showery, lighter outbreaks across southern Scotland this afternoon, northern Scotland as well, wet and windy. And for parts of Northern Ireland, there will be sunshine and showers, as there will be across England and Wales later. Some of those showers are likely to be heavy and thundery, especially out towards parts of the west. Temperatures will be around average for the time of year, highs of around 10 to 12 degrees Celsius. Now, overnight, some of the showers continue across the west for a time, but they mostly fade away, and it will be a mainly dry and clear night across Scotland and Northern Ireland, far north of England, with a patchy frost. Meanwhile, across parts of England and Wales, there'll be yet more rain spreading northwards across many parts of central and southern areas of England and Wales, and wet and windy weather also spreading to Devon and Cornwall. Both these areas of rain will be spreading northwards through tomorrow. So throughout the day, it will be wet and it will be very windy, especially from the southwest. Temperatures will still be around average for the time of year as well. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Welcome to the show. We have lots coming up over the next few hours, including a look at Rishi's mini cabinet reshuffle, the increasing lack of love amongst the public for the NHS and the humorless tube bosses who ordered the withdrawal of an ad featuring a hot dog over obesity fears. And today we're joined in the studio by two presenters, friends. We usually present, pretend we've got one. Uh, we're pretending we've got two friends today, and they are political campaigns consultant Rebecca Ryan and journalist and author Ella Whelan. Thank you for both coming along. Uh, we're going to cover this story at the end of the show, but let's uh, kick off the show with it as well. Uh, Transport for London, uh, the Mayor, London Mayor Sadiq Khan's uh, transport system. Uh, somehow or other seems to think it has a crucial role to play in the obesity crisis, if we have one. Not sure we do. Uh, and uh, recently they took down an advert for a stage play featuring a wedding cake, because you, if you eat a wedding cake, you might get <laughs> fat. And now a comedian has advertised his tour with a picture of a hot dog. He's had to replace that with a cucumber, because hot dogs make you fat. What on earth does Khan think he's doing? Well, it's just, this is ridiculous, isn't it? Because I don't think someone seeing a picture of a hot dog or seeing a picture of a wedding cake, especially if they're advertising completely different things, is going to suddenly make people run out and think, oh, I need to get hot dog and cake right now. We do have an obesity crisis, without a doubt, but um, I don't think being puritanical about adverts on the tube is going to move the needle one jot. It's just, it's ludicrous. It's sort of, you know, it's sort of controlling... Uh, authoritarian behaviour on steroids, frankly. What are the statistics for our obesity crisis? How many people are in crisis because of their obesity? 60% of the population. Mean? It's 60%? It's not uh, overweight. It, this isn't obese. actually about obesity, though, because uh, necessarily, because a number of years ago, I think it was 2016 or something like that, the, there was a big story about banning adverts on the tube around the Beach Body Ready adverts, yeah. if you remember. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, advertising lose weight powder, whatever. You know that stuff that people mm. put in it's milk? It's called cocaine, is it? <laughs> <laughs> and um, and uh, I remember at the time going to the protest and interviewing women who were calling for Sikh Khan to ban the adverts. And it was all about the idea that people are, in, are sort of sheeple, are influenced by what they see and can't control themselves and this would make women feel bad. So that at the time was talking about things that would make you too thin and now it's about things that would allegedly make you too fat. But the, the, the whole issue is the idea that TfL, by extension Steve Khan, thinks that Londoners or tourists are unable to think for themselves and mm. need to be protected from, exactly, in this exactly. case, images just, of hot dogs. We're just idiots, you know. Exactly. Well, what it's do you so think? Isn't it, it is patronising. What do you think is worse, uh, Rebecca, uh, the child obesity crisis or the child starvation crisis? Or well, are they kind of like neck and neck, are they? You know, I think there's a, hard I think to square there's a, one with the other, isn't I it? Think, yeah, exactly. I mean, this is the thing. I think that kids do have an issue, but it comes down to the parents. You know, I mean, you do see your kids nowadays in schools. I've got, I've got a daughter. That, that you know, there, there are, they have got a, a weight issue. A, a larger percentage of them now than than when we were growing up. But it comes down to parents taking responsibility, doesn't it? And and actually seeing a hot dog. The hot dog. There's not really anything too wrong with a hot dog. It's not, it's not you know full yeah. on 
cheese double bacon burger or whatever like that. But it's getting into that debate, like you say, where it's it's too patronising to think that people can't just look at a hot dog and then they're immediately going to eat. It's not even advertising them. eating hot dogs. That's the <laughs> bit that makes absolutely no dog. sense. It's advertising a comedy tour. A hot yeah. dog is a square meal. You've got yeah. carbs, protein, people bit of veg might. on top people of your like ketchup. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. The, but I actually think that the upset talking about obesity or people's health is fine and interesting, important. But we are getting into the realm now where it's sort of crossing over almost into eating disorder territory, where you're you're messaging people that food is to be feared, that food is terrible, um, and that you'll you'll do it if you even look at some some manner of junk food, whether it's a hot dog or wedding cake, then you'll be in danger. I mean, that's not a great yeah, message I mean, to be sending young people either. I'm all about I'm all about people just making informed choices, and I think that actually for a long time we haven't taught basics in school like home economics. Most kids out there probably couldn't even make a ham sandwich, <laughs> let alone or you know cook an egg. That that I think is a big problem because when people can't actually cook for themselves using fresh ingredients that are affordable, then and they're going to reach for the chicken nuggets that are yeah. you know endlessly more cheaper in the supermarket frozen section than something like a lean piece of chicken breast so exactly. you know and that, that got, is an issue for and what me. we've actually got is an anxiety epidemic amongst teenagers you know teenage girls particularly at the moment they, they are just so stressed out by you know what's the right thing to eat as mm -hmm. you were saying you know about their weight and all of those kinds of things and just they need to learn resilience and they should be learning it from their parents and, and society should just be carrying on around them and not trying to you know edit every single thing that they see because it's just making matters worse well, the people i have sympathy for are, are the parents who are often the single parents, the mums, who can't afford all these fresh, wonderful ingredients. The, the problem is, the system we have now is a lot of these processed foods are much, much cheaper yeah. than healthy, uh, fresh foods. And so they get the cheaper option. But that maybe we've got to do something about that because uh, the pound in their pocket is what is dictating their diets. Uh, yeah. uh, but also the other big story today, of course, is uh, the ever-present migrant crisis. And we found out all about Abdul Azidi, uh, the chemical attacker in Clapham, who uh, threw himself into the Thames. We think he's dead. We hope he's dead. Uh, <laughs> well, just buried a body, but so... But, assumes he is. but the full horror, the full horror of his application to become a resident of Britain, his, his asylum uh, si uh, system, his asylum application has now been laid bare and it is very, very frightening insofar as he's turned down, I think, three or four times and allowed to stay uh, after being convicted of a sex offence uh, because he uh, tr converted to Christianity and uh, the vicar who helped to, to convert him used to have to escort him to church to keep the female members of the congregation safe because he'd just been convicted of a sex crime and the judge went on to say, great, stick around. Your asylum application is granted. Unbelievable. Much more of this in just a little while. But we're asking you, uh, who is to blame for Azidi being granted asylum in the UK? Is it the church? Is it the judge? Or is it the government? Uh, let us know what you think. Uh, you can uh, call us on 0344 499 uh, You can text us, write talk at the beginning of your message and send it to 87222. Or, of course, you can tweet us here on X at Talk TV. Well, to our top story now. And the Home Secretary has ordered a meeting with church leaders after it was revealed Clapham chemical attacker Abdul Zaidi was granted asylum by a judge despite lying and failing a Christianity test. Files published yesterday show Azadi was allowed to stay in the UK after he claimed he had converted to Christianity. And a now retired reverend from Grange Road Baptist Church supported his application. The Home Office had rejected Azadi's claims for asylum based on his conversion, saying he'd used religion for his own ends. But an appeal court judge overturned this ruling in 2020. The documents also revealed the church knew about Azadi's sexual assault conviction and had even restricted his attempt to services and ensured he was always accompanied by two male members. Oh, how life affirming for the women of Britain. Yeah. Well, joining us now is writer and clergyman, Reverend Michael Curran. Uh, Michael, I've been saying from the beginning uh, of this whole scandal that uh, whilst it's all very well government and, and lawyers and the Home Office pointing fingers at the church, I'm a Christian. When someone goes to a vicar and says, I'm interested in Christianity, I want to convert, that is their job. It is the Home Office's job to deal with asylum applications. And as far as I can tell, the Home office had flagged up this issue about him using Christianity for his own ends and not being convinced by it and yet the application was 
processed anyway, but should the church also be having a look at itself and its role in all of this? Yeah, it should always be looking at itself. And don't apologise for pointing fingers at the church. I do it every day of my career. I mean, <laughs> a lot of people were very naive here. And um, have you ever met a naive vicar? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> of course I have. <laughs> all the time. And there are a lot of people to blame. I mean, what we mustn't do, what we shouldn't do, though, is to draw sweeping generalisations from this. I have people, I mean, I, I live in, in Toronto, Canada, and we have a, a situation that's not as acute, but it's not dissimilar. And there are people who come to me, not just of refugee status, but because they want things and they claim to be Christian. Um, you know, my dad was a Jewish cabbie from Hackney. My mum was a company from Stepney Green. I ain't convinced easily. And um, you see through people and you have to be caring and compassionate. It doesn't mean you turn them away, but you don't always believe them. And in the case of this vicar here, I don't know the guy, and I'm sure, well, I assume he meant well, but you can help someone. You can try and feed them and you can try and find them housing and maybe some health care. That doesn't mean that you support their claim to be in the country when you know there's been a, a, a drastic criminal history to that person. And the idea that he had to be escorted to make sure that women in the congregation were safe is quite appalling. But I know, I mean, I, I'm in Britain quite a lot of the time. I know people in the UK from Muslim countries, I Iran in particular, actually, who have become Christian and they're, they're wonderful members of a congregation. They would never dream of breaking the law. There are also people who claim to be Christian for refugee reasons and motives, and you never see them again, but they don't break the law in any way. This is not confined to religion, by the way. There are people who claim to be gay because they know that they might not be returned to a country that's deeply homophobic. They're not always telling the truth. People try their best to find out if these things are genuine. When it comes to religion, it, it becomes ambiguous and vague because we, we like to think of, of people of faith being very naive and too trusting. You can't be too trusting, but you can be insufficiently wise. And perhaps that is what has happened here. I think uh, in the case of Abdul Adizi, it was a bit of both. I mean, the level of trusting here was off the scale. Uh, oh, he's a good Christian. He uh, communicates well with the rest of the congregation. Oh, by the way, we have to get two guys to escort him into the congregation to keep the women safe because he's just been convicted of a sex offence and yet we still back him for his asylum application. Uh, you know, uh, the church, I don't blame them for trying to convert people for whatever reason, uh, but they've got to train themselves to be a little bit more sceptical, a little bit more circumspect about these uh, asylum seekers who seem to be queuing up at church doors uh, because well, for some no, reason they, they get allowed to stay if they're Christians. I, I, with all due respect, I think that's a bit of a cartoon. I mean, uh, I, I don't think there are people lining up at church doors to be converted. And I don't think the church is actually, it could be more zealous in trying to bring people to faith. If anything, the Church of England in particular is very nervous about being too evangelistic. But there are people who come who are searching. They're lonely, they're, they're desperate, they're looking for something and they may have a genuine faith. But you see, you, you can accept someone as a Christian and baptise them and not necessarily support them for being a refugee. I mean, those two things are not always compatible. And if someone's going back to a country where they will face persecution, even murder, and in some nations that's the case, then of course it becomes very murky. But it's not always the case. And I mean, I've dealt with people who've come to me and they, they say they've, they've received Jesus, they, they want to be baptised, but there's something in their life that's very troubling. And I can say to them, I will baptize you. I will receive you into the church, but you have to put something right first. You have to admit what you've done. Um, and I'm, I'm not a Catholic priest, but in, in a Catholic priest in confession, I think would say to someone who, who told them they've committed a crime, you have to go to the police. I can't give you absolution until you've paid the price for that crime and admitted what you've done. So it's not quite as linear and black and white as we think. And although, as I say, there are some naive clergy not everyone. We, we, we work with people on the margins a great deal of the time. We see a lot of life and death that most people never experience. I mean, I, I am a church-going Christian and I find myself wrestling regularly with uh, ideas of, you know, what is the right and just and good thing to do. And I find well, that the Church of England especially seems to just blindly wade into politics and sort of say that such issues are uncontested when perhaps they are, whether it's talking about, you know, wading in on what's going on with asylum seekers, wading in on paying reparations about slavery. And I think it's becoming very confusing because the division between church and state, church and politics, leave unto Caesar what is Caesar's, is now becoming increasingly blurred. 
Well, I'm not sure. I don't want to get into theology with you, but I'm not sure if actually that exchange is about church and state being separated. It's about a pagan symbol on a coin. However, look, there, there are, I'm, I'm in the Anglican Church in Canada, not Church of England, but there are many people in the Anglican Communion, uh, people of color, by the way, who don't think a billion pounds of reparations is appropriate. Of course, apologize for past uh, uh, crimes and wrongs. We'd also like to acknowledge that campaigners against slavery were evangelical Christians, William Wilberforce and Thomas Clarkson. Uh, there are many Christians, many people in the Church of England who don't always agree with the leadership of the church. Uh, so that's not blanket people. I think, though, often uh, the Church of England is fairly balanced. Look at its statements on Israel and Gaza. It hasn't taken an extreme position. It talks about releasing hostages, uh, condemning Hamas, but also caring for the lives of ordinary Palestinians. We live in an age of, of polarization and people are very unforgiving. And if you actually read what the church says, it's generally some of the better uh, commentaries on the body politic than, than you see elsewhere. Uh, last question, uh, Michael. You're, you're an esteemed uh, commentator in The Spectator magazine, loving your work. Uh, this isn't really a religious question. It's a, a suggestion that I, that I have, uh, that if we practice it properly, it might sort this problem out. Uh, that is to extract the equation of conversion to Christ Christianity from the, the asylum application process. In other words, it cannot be a factor in whether or not you stay in this country. So if you want to convert to Christi Christianity, go right ahead, but it will not affect your application to stay in this country in any way. How about that? Well, it's an interesting point. I understand why you're making it. The problem is, if um, I mean, in Iran, for example, if you're born a Christian, uh, life is manageable. If you convert from Islam to Christianity, there's a very good chance you'll be arrested and possibly killed. And the same would apply to Afghanistan. Not every Muslim country, but in, the, in those in particular. It's a difficult one. Um, judges generally are pretty good at this. They do understand what is going on. And we're talking about one or two cases here. For the most part, people do realize when there's a con being played. Now, I mean, Fred, yeah. I don't think you can distract those two, those two issues. They are relevant. If someone's life is at risk, if they return to their country of origin, surely as, as compassionate people, we have to listen to them. Uh, Michael, excellent to talk to you. Thank you very much for your time. That's Sir Reverend Michael Corran over there in Canada. Uh, still with us, uh, our journalist and author Ella Whelan and political campaigns consultant Rebecca Ryan. I mean, the thing is, uh, Michael, they refer to the sort of cartoonish element of this saga of Abdul Azidi. Uh, and, you know, the, the mistakes in this are just egregious. I mean, they're grotesque, shocking. Uh, let's hope to God... Yeah, God, there, <laughs> coming into the conversation, always crops up. He's always he? present, He's Kev. there, he's, he's always present. present. He's come to me. <laughs> it's a, Truly, it's a miracle. Uh, but um, uh, we hope to God that mm. this doesn't, hasn't happened anywhere else and that surely from now on, at the very least, you get convicted of a sex crime, tell you what, you're on the next plane home. Absolutely. I mean, things we're an open and tolerant society, but that open and tolerance is based on the sort of foundations of fairness and of law and order. And those two things are on really rocky ground at the moment, aren't they? And that's what's so upsetting for people is this sort of sense of hang on a minute. This guy here was having to be escorted into church because he was a threat to the, the female uh, congregation. And yet he's Christian enough to warrant... It, that just does not make sense. And now he's had a, a, a Muslim uh, funeral. You know, this is just it's sort of laughing in people's faces, isn't it? Yeah. And this is what people just are really, really upset about. He told his mates, by the way, when he converted to uh, Christianity, he said, I'm still a good Muslim. Mm. So, I mean, it was just a bizarre episode. I just hope it's not being uh, replicated on a multiple basis. Well, I mean, as, as with all things relating to immigration, I think really the the... So the answer to this boils down to some really boring questions being asked just about process um, in terms of the asylum system. Because, you know, I think, you know, as both of you have said, the church believing in redemption, that people can change, wanting to convert people to Christianity, that's all as it should be. And I don't think, you know... The sort that's of their job, them, that's what they it's do. It's their job. The walking them down the aisle thing is, is a bit, bit bizarre to, for the women's protection. But, you know, that's the church's job. The Home Office's job and the, and the system uh, of sort yeah. of bureaucracy in this country is meant to be a very basic level of 
We know who's coming in. We know what they've done. We know our level of security, and we that that that's out of the yeah. that's out of the question now. It doesn't happen. The sort of basic level of data isn't being recorded, and right. so it's not just the judges' fault because we know there's a whole row going on there. But it's just the basic system of paperwork, proper processing in government that's yeah. failing us. I want to I want to pick up on what you said about basic levels of data because something that's been troubling me for quite a while now is you look at other countries and the reporting of crime and crime statistics by nationality, and we've got lots of of information now coming out of Sweden, coming out of Denmark, coming out of Netherlands, coming out of Germany, which is directly connecting a huge uptick in serious sexual assaults and, and rapes. And let's not forget what happened in Cologne on that New Year's Eve to people coming in from very different cultures where their attitudes towards women are different. Now, if there's one thing in my mind that the Azadi incident should bring right into sharp focus is whether women's safety and women's rights are being mortgaged at the altar of political correctness. What next? We've had grooming gangs. We've got the Azadi situation. It seems to me that this is a debate that needs to be had. Absolutely. And it is, it is it's scary for women out there, out there in the real world, who are having to live um, in, in, in an environment where they're not sure, they don't know because they're reading these reports. There's this sort of cultural extreme sort of uh, polarity between what's, what's happening. And they're just a, a lack of sense of safety that people are entitled to in their, you know, in their own hometown. And by but the way, let, let's not forget that if it wasn't for this obscene bureaucratic farce uh, that a w poor woman wouldn't be fighting to keep her sight and her kids wouldn't yeah. be covered in alkaline. Mm -hmm. Keeping this guy here is, is what allowed him to do what he did. Uh, well, so we have to be careful with who we let stay in this country. But well, unless we're going to pull up the drawbridge for anyone who's from a different culture to ours, mm -hmm. which is, I don't think, no, would be moral or that. right mm -hmm. or politically, you know, politically correct in the genuine sense, mm -hmm. um, we have to start asking ourselves why, as a... Uh, <laughs> as a nation with a certain set of values, we're failing to uh, convince people that women are free and equal to men, that we live a certain way of life, that there are views that we don't tolerate in terms of sexism, <sighs> extreme violence, but also just general treatment of women. Well, I'm not sort of saying, oh, the fault is all ours, but I do think we have to look in the mirror a little bit and say, what is it about British values that we're failing to yeah, inculcate yeah, yeah, in people, yeah. that we're failing to talk about? Why aren't we more confident about putting forward, you know, ideas of democracy, freedom of speech, tolerance, um, freedom to go about life living, you know, wearing what you want as a woman or a man or whatever. So I, I do think we need to do a little bit of soul searching alongside making the government just do its basic job of saying, what is it that's good about living in this country? How can we promote that? Very well more? Said, basic but... job of if you've committed a sexual offence, then you're gone out of the country mm. by deported well, over. I would just say it's good having two previous friends, <laughs> isn't it? I'm rather, rather enjoying this. Now, your texts and tweets have been coming in thick and fast since lunchtime. On this issue, we were asking who's to blame for Azadi being granted asylum in the UK, church, judge or government? Tricia writes, our justice system, our councils and our useless, gutless, spineless government. So many to blame, but it does stop with our government. And, oh, sorry, that, I saw my name. I nearly read this out. Carry on. <laughs> Kevin has tweeted. That's what he was doing <laughs> just was before uh, coming into the studio. So, all three plus everyone on the woke left and the people who continue to vote for the mainstream parties. That does sound you like see, you, actually. You can't beat a Kevin, can you? Yeah. Uh, Dilly adds, uh, well, it definitely wasn't the government for once because they didn't want to, him to get in. Blame should be laid on the judge and the church. The judge wouldn't have made that decision without the church stepping in. And Nick writes, the government. <laughs> they have a majority and could have changed every law by making it easier to deport people. Lefty lawyers and judges can only operate under the laws set by the government. Now, coming up after the break, a double resignation forces Rishi Sunak into a mini reshuffle as Education Minister Robert Halfon and Armed Forces Minister James Heapy both quit their posts. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you are with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, oi, treat girl.
when JK Rowling says, let's just be honest. That's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, we're absolutely. Supposed to it was another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and this is Crosstalk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Well, the ever-evolving chaos continues for the Tory party after two more MPs have quit, forcing Rishi Sunak to arrange a micro-reshuffle. Armed Forces Minister James Heapy followed up on his previous promise to step down and has been replaced by Leo Doherty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, never heard of him before either. <laughs> Meanwhile, Robert Halfon has stepped down as Education Minister and has been replaced by... Luke Hall. Who? Yep, me neither. And we're still... That's what they do at football matches when they bring on substitutes. Who are you? Who? Uh, and that was a couple of who's, wasn't it? Uh, we're still joined in the studio by political campaigns consultant Rebecca Ryan and journalist and author uh, Ella Whelan. I mean, we were talking earlier uh, that uh, Rishi, uh, uh, Ella, seems to be at the centre of this sort of firestorm of disintegration. Mm. You know, 63 Tory MPs have now said they're not standing at the election. We've got cabinet ministers stepping down. The polls are re uh, recording uh, the worst ever poll results for the Tory party. Uh, John Curtis, the John Curtis, the doyen of the uh, pollsters. Uh, we pressed him on it last week. He was a little less forthcoming. But this week, he says it's 99% yeah. certain that the Tories will lose mm. the next election. So Rishi is just... It's almost pathetic and tragic. He's fighting such a losing battle. But, I, you know, I've got no sympathy. It's his fault. No, it is his... Well, it's not just his fault. It's the party's fault. Mm. Um, and it is tragic. I mean, it's quite remarkable you've had over the last 24 hours some pretty senior conservative commentators who are relatively influential, um, going on various channels, talking about how Rishi Sunak himself is thinking about stepping down. Uh, Tim Montgomery saying, you know, oh, I think he can see where the problem's like. No, I mean, you just think, Jesus, this... I mean, talk about airing your dirty laundry in public. This is, like, yeah. unbelievable. The Conservative Party cannot keep itself together. Um, I, I think it's... 
I'm no fan of the Conservative Party, never voted for them, never will. Um, but the, I think it's important to have a strong opposition if Labour is now almost sort of um, certain to get in. And the, the depressing thing about the Conservative Party is that they have no interest in, the seem, seemingly no interest in the future of British politics. They've completely given up. I think the message coming across to voters is, why bother? You know, why yeah, that's bother? it. Uh, that's it, isn't it, Rebecca? The, uh, um, abstain will probably win the next election. <laughs> Don't yeah, bother absolutely. voting. Sit that will be hand. the biggest number. It Indeed. seriously will be. Well, the thing is, what it comes back to is, is politics is all about numbers at the end of the day, and it's all about the sort of momentum of how things are going. And we are now just... The Conservative Party is just in a tailspin. You know, this absolute chaos that's uncontrollable, mm. and everybody can see it. And you see, um, you know, ministers like Robert Halfon, who is, you know... a hard-working sort of blue-collar conservative kind of guy who is, you know, Tory through and through. And he's just he's just seen, you know, the what's what's coming down the line for him. And he, he, it's not it's not enough for him to sort of fight another fight. And that really tells you something, doesn't it? When all of these people are, you know, saying, you know what, I'm not going to I'm not going to stand again. Um, and it is it's, it is concerning. And as you say, there needs to be a strong opposition. I think the, the conservatives after the next general election, when the 99% the certainty that the Labour comes yeah. in, they will get themselves back together. The Conservative Party yeah. um, have a way of doing that. They're like cockroaches in, a, <laughs> in yeah. an apocalypse. They will get themselves back together. You're, um, you're what right, form will they, take? they will get themselves yeah. back together. There might be a slight name change yeah. to Reform UK. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, should we talk about uh, one of the problems, of course, uh, that Rishi is facing, one of his many problems, is he's under fire... Uh, because uh, Jeremy Hunt's now completely forgotten non-budget, uh, what was it, three weeks ago, didn't give any more money to our defences, despite uh, the delicate condition the world is in. Uh, and uh, now uh, various military uh, luminaries are saying the amount of money we are spending on munitions uh, does not meet uh, the threats that we face, and that uh, if we uh, went to war with any enemies, we wouldn't last very long. And even Grant Shapps, the Def Defence Secretary, is demanding that Rishi uh, increases defence spending to 2.5%. We currently uh, spend 2.2%. Uh, but defence is a big problem, isn't it? Absolutely. And this is coming back to this sort of the general election. This is the uh, bread and butter of Conservative Party um, campaigning, is the armed forces. Everybody wants, you know, a strong security as a key priority. Obviously, when after the, the first priority, which is, you know, your energy bills and cost of living. You know, after that, we want to feel safe on a global scale. So, yeah, they, they absolutely need to do something about this. But at the moment, their concentration is on all they're looking at is the general election. That's what's coming down the line. And they seem to be sort of so paralysed that um, with this tailspin that they're in, they're unable to deliver on any of these, these promises that they've made. Again, the defence... Uh, issue is a really good example of how the Conservatives have absolutely no discipline. I mean, Grant Shapps has been running his mouth about the prospect of world war now for weeks in a way that I think is actually dangerous and, yeah. and irresponsible. Yeah. Um, you know, in, in this kind of uh, very obvious way of sort of trying to position him as some kind of mover and shaker in um, any future political landscape. Yes. <laughs> but, you know, at the, and at the same time, you know, when the UK does face some serious questions about its defence preparation, not just ammunition, which is sort of the story of today, but you know, also the fact of, of of man and woman power of the you know the what we were just talking about in terms of British values, having actual people being able to sign up to a defence system which would you know defend those values. All of that is a serious consideration at a time when geopolitics is incredibly volatile and. It's just that you want a bit of you want some adults in the room in relation to this, rather than just a lot of people running their mouth. But I mean, look, Grant Shapps isn't the only person who, as a defence secretary, to say that we are a fast approaching potential wars of attrition on the continent that will involve British troops. Um, it seems to me that the government is constantly reactive and has no way of forward planning, whether that's in terms of energy security, whether that's in terms of defence spending. It's always basically five steps behind what needs to be done. Absolutely. Yeah, it, uh, yeah, and you know the the solution to all of these questions is to have a booming economy that can match the 
challenges that we face, whether it's in relation to energy, defense spending, education, whatever it is. And you've got in this next generation, Jeremy Hunt, who just likes to play around with tax, basically. It's all he's interested in. And the Labour Party saying, sorry, there's no money. We can't do anything. Did the Labour Party our... say anything? Well, I feel like I they wouldn't need the one. That's the policy. But they they both, need to, both yeah. parties are telling voters, we are living in times of austerity and there's nothing we can do about it. That is the overriding message mm. of, in this upcoming general election. That's not good enough. Uh, and I'll tell you what else isn't good enough. That's the NHS, another problem for Rishi. Uh, front page of the Times today, uh, it says Britain is fast falling out of love with the NHS. Was it in love with the NHS? Uh, ever since some people banged those pots and pans, uh, they realised that maybe uh, this health service of ours is not, as we always bizarrely maintain, the envy of the world. Maybe it isn't amazing. And uh, this story reveals that one in uh, uh, four people uh, felt trapped. Uh, what well, only one in four people were satisfied with the NHS. I'd like to know who they. I were. know. I'm who amazed. Are, who that are many? this 25 percent who think this is a great <laughs> health service and that uh, people increasingly feel trapped in a toxic relationship with the NHS? Your thoughts, uh, Rebecca? Absolutely. Well, the thing is, the, the main point of contact between the NHS and, and the British people is their GP surgery. And at the moment, you, yeah. you can't <laughs> get an appointment with a GP for love nor money. You know, how do you actually see anybody? So we've, we've, we've come to now a new way of being where we just, if we have an ache or a pain, which it, to some extent we had to readjust because people were going to the GP for absolutely anything which they didn't need to do. Um, but we've sort of swung too far the other way where everybody is sort of making do and just sort of struggling on through. And that will lead to resentment on, on the NHS to sort of say, you know, you're not actually doing anything for us. You know, we can't, we can't get to the GP in order to get that sort of gateway through to further services. Mm. So what are we actually paying for? I mean, interesting here, actually, that we're streeting Shadow Health Minister of the Labour Party is the only person, it seems to me, to be sort of sabre-rattling over the idea of privatising the NHS, which is a bit of a move from the traditional Labour political stomping ground. Well, I think, you know, I, like lots of people, still believe in the idea of a state provided free at the point of access service in in the round. It's a lovely but idea. I think, yeah. But I think that also a lot of people think there are certain services that could be paid for and that you could have... A, a, just a, a varied approach to this. I mean, if you want to look at the, the sort of the mixed bag that the NHS is and why it's got so many problems, there's this one really great example, which is that, you know, we're living at a time when stories about maternity scandals are a daily occurrence, about babies and mothers dying, maternity care being like some kind of developing country. I mean, like the worst you could imagine. De uh, you know, deaths that shouldn't be happening, happening on a weekly basis. That's happening, and at the same time, the NHS has just re released an advertising campaign um, with lovely pictures of babies telling parents to hug their children to promote brain health. So you've got an NHS which is positing itself as such an expert on child rearing that it has to tell parents to hug their child, at the same time as being incapable of keeping babies alive at birth. Mm. So there is, you know, the priorities of the NHS has become this incredibly bloated monster that thinks that it's, and its priorities are completely out of whack. Mm. And what we need to do is strip it right back to being like the original Bevan, you know, idea of curing the sick and doing the business of, of medicine yeah. Yeah. rather than the sort of all the extras that are campaigning. The, the problem with the NHS isn't that it hasn't got enough money, it gets 200 billion quid a year, it's the way they spend it. You know, you could kick off maybe by having a look at the 3,500 un medically unqualified middle managers who earn £100,000 or more. It is a basket case. They've got to learn how to spend the money properly and the problems would to end. Yeah. Any civil service department that knows how to spend money properly is a sort of... Well, they, they know how to spend money on diversity. <laughs> they spend a lot of money on diversity. Private and tends inclusivity. to know how to spend money properly. Right, we have more of your texts and tweets coming in this lunchtime. Following the unveiling of documents showing why the Clapham attacker was allowed to stay in the UK, we were asking, who's actually to blame for Azadi being granted asylum? Was it the church, the judge or the government? Ed says... All of them. It needs to be investigated and everyone involved needs to be charged and sentenced for their part in the attack. Ian writes, all three instruments of the state no longer act in the interests of the majority. And meanwhile, Lily has tweeted, the judge needs to be held accountable. And Colin says, absolutely everyone listed and half the country's voters <laughs> too. Very good point, very good oh, point. There you are.
Now, coming up after the break, the search for six missing workers continues after a major bridge collapsed in Baltimore yesterday. But what impact will this horrific incident have on global supply chains? We'll be discussing that next. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And you are with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put the statue of the Queen on the fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips, and this is Cross Talk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, the recovery mission for six missing people continues after a bridge collapsed in Baltimore yesterday. The bridge spanned the entrance to the port of Baltimore, which is the ninth busiest port in the United States. Officials have announced that maritime traffic through the port will be suspended until further notice, raising fears of significant disruption to global supply chains. We're still, of course, joined by political campaigns consultant Rebecca Ryan and journalist and consultant... Uh, journalist and consultant Rebecca Ryan again, apparently. <laughs> Both Rebecca Ryan. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, uh, Ella Whelan. So, I mean, it, it was huge, you know, news across the world yesterday, the dramatic images of this, this bridge coming down. But it did sort of raise certain amounts of questions about how much our infrastructure across the Western world is, especially when it's been built 50 years ago, is, is able to contend with the huge supplies that we're now getting from the Far East and the massive cargo and so on and so forth. Um, and now it looks as though this is going to yet again disrupt global supply chain, something we saw after COVID. Yeah, it's concerning, isn't it? Um, it, it the impact that this will have, as you say, is in this such a, such a large port. But um, I think that shop video was just absolutely shocking and it's sort of been really shocking for a lot of people seeing that. 
how were, that was able to happen. So it, it would be really interesting to see, you know, when the investigation comes back, the results of the investigation come back, how it was actually able to happen. Um, and, and yeah, well, the, the, the impact, hopefully, it, you know, they'll be able to... I mean, these things, they take sort of six weeks to get from China to the UK, don't they? You know, this is not a short journey. How the, how, so you, that, that's the kind of um, ripple effect that it will have. Um, Ella, have a listen to this. Uh, this is really dramatic. This is coppers talking just as the bridge was collapsing and the commanding officer basically saying, what the hell's going on? And telling one of his officers to get across the other side of the bridge and the guy going, kind of going to be difficult to so have a listen. Mm -hmm. I need one of you guys on the south side, one of you guys on the north side, hold all traffic on the key bridge. Uh, there's a ship approaching that just lost their steering. So that until you get that under control, we got to stop all traffic. C-13 dispatch, the whole bridge just fell down. Start, start, whoever, everybody. The whole bridge just collapsed. Simple dispatch is direct. That's correct. First time. Collapsed suddenly. Uh, the commanding officer there giving us a little window into what was going on, saying that this boat had lost its steering. We saw the lights go out and come back on several times, and then the collision with the bridge. What do you make of the bridge collapsing like a deck of cards? It's apparently called a, a steel truss bridge or something. Always avoid things with the name truss in. That's what I've found to be useful. Uh, but seriously, uh, it, I mean, it went really quick. They go, oh, well, that's what these bridges are like. Well, maybe uh, we should not have any more steel <laughs> truss bridges then. Well, uh, Joe Biden has promised that the US government is going to pay for the rebuilding of the bridge. There does seem to be a huge amount of momentum around taking it seriously and getting things uh, whether it's sort of um, the port itself or transport between the two sides of the river um, back up and running, that's all being taken very seriously. I mean, you know, I think uh, accidents do happen. And obviously there are big questions for why, it, you know, a ship like that doesn't didn't have some kind of backup control for steering or, you know, all those things will come out. The black box has been re recovered mm -hmm. and all, all that information will be important. Um, but I think, I, I suppose the big question that people will be asking is, what Alex, what you mentioned, you know, whether it's sort of problems in the Suez Canal or anywhere else, we are incorrect, we don't realise how dependent we are yeah. on very small room for manoeuvre of things going wrong yeah. um, all across the world for it to cause huge disruption in yeah. different parts of... Hello, inflation, our old friend. Uh, Rebecca, let's move on to your specialist subject, the BBC. Tim David, the <laughs> Director General... Uh, was addressing Parliament yesterday, talking about uh, the need uh, to look into reforming the licence, the TV licence fee, uh, and also how it is enforced. Uh, but basically saying, oh, you've got to still give us all this money every year. I mean, I think he might be conceding that a reduction uh, might be in order and perhaps we won't send people to prison if they don't play to pay to watch Strictly Come Dancing. But I think all the BBC lot do is kick this can down the road in the hope that they can still con millions of people into giving them 170 quid a year for a rubbish TV service. Absolutely. I mean, the biggest thing that we welcome is the uh, the decriminalisation. He's saying that he's seriously considering decriminalising uh, non-payment of the TV licence, which would, which would be hugely impactful because... You know, these are these are vulnerable people, and 75% of the of the people who were prosecuted are, are women who, which is just sort of clearly disproportionate. Yeah. There's something going very wrong here, and these are people because of the way the license fee works. They it's attached to the house, not the person. So whoever's at home at the time they knock on the door, it's often the woman, it, it will often it? be a woman because she's working part time, she's looking after kids, um, or it can be vulnerable people. So these are the people who are getting prosecuted. Um, but if you take away the criminalisation aspect then the, th the, th the threat of those letters, because people are bombarded with letters with threats of fines and those kinds of things, and it's also very unclear as to what you can and can't watch without a TV licence. The BBC is very clever about the way it words it. So people don't want to take the risk of not having a TV licence when actually people, a lot of people don't need it now. We're going to have a little lesson to Tim Davey uh, earlier on. He's 56 years old. He likes to wear white trainers with his suits. Don't know whether he did uh, when he spoke to Sky News yesterday, but here he is. If you look at the inflation on other commercial services, it's been far, far higher than the BBC. Having said that, we are in a, as you say, a very privileged position. And the thing I would say is, one is... I'm not here just simply to drive the licence fee higher. That's not my job. My job is to make sure that 
everyone, every household gets good value for money. So they don't at the moment, do they, Ella, in your estimation? Well, if you look at what Davy in various interviews over the last few days has, has said his focus for the BBC is, he's all about the fact-checking side of things. So he said, well, you know, this is really important. It's not about making good programmes or generally what most people want from telly, which is a nice bit of drama and a good bit of news coverage or something, you know, a bit of a mix. The BBC is obsessed with the idea of being the fact checker general. Mm. And we know that that whole issue of BBC fact checker is incredibly contentious. The question of mm. bias within their um, news coverage, you've got lots of their previous huge hitting presenters, Ma, Mateless, um, leaving and suddenly revealing that they you know, hated Brexit all along and things that we knew from. <laughs> that was a shocker, wasn't it? And, and, you know, the whole kind of Gary Lineker row. I mean, the, the issue of political bias within the BBC is certainly yeah. one that exists and they are failing to recognise yeah. that. I think most people who look at the TV licence don't see it as... I mean, I, you know, I love the BBC. I Like I always say, I co-parent with CBBS. There's lots of it that I find incredibly helpful <laughs> and useful. Um, and I don't want to see it go, but I think most people would pay for it. Most people, yeah. you know, the idea that you have to have a TV licence not to watch the BBC, yeah. to watch any telly is outrageous. Exactly yeah. right. And, uh, you know, T Tim Davey just wants to keep that money rolling in and uh, I've, I've got nothing against the BBC. I just don't want to pay for it. And it's a lousy service and they're being beaten by Netflix and all the streaming services. And yet they sit there and say, oh, it's so useful, socials and everything we do. And by the way, the big question, Mariana, Mariana Spring is their, dis their <laughs> fabulous name, disinformation correspondent. Uh, she uh, came forth on the on the uh, uh, Kate picture saga, and it was like, here's the definitive truth. Hey, Mariana, here's the, here's the question. Who fact, fact checks the fact checkers? Mm. That's the point. Why is she the voice from above? Uh, uh, let's talk about Alan Titchmarsh. Uh, he wears jeans when he goes into the garden, mm. uh, but uh, apparently, allegedly, well, no, Amazingly, some British TV channel is selling uh, Alan Titchmarsh programmes to North Korea where they don't like his jeans. <laughs> it's unbelievable. I mean, I really like that Alan Titchmarsh has come back and said yeah. that he doesn't... Re you know, he's flattered to be such a sex symbol in the same line as Elvis and, you know, all the great jeans wearers of history. I'm not sure that's quite what's at stake, but it's it, it's funny that the this issue of sort of Western influence and the, the symbolism of jeans as being the ultimate... You know, ultimate it's Western imperialism, yeah. that's what it is. Um, yeah. Still exists, but I think actually most of us have kind of gone off. Certainly gardening in jeans doesn't appeal to me at all, not least yeah. getting the grass stains out. <laughs> he does look dangerous there, though, doesn't he, Alex? Very threatening. Don't you think he looks dangerous, well, seditious? I'm just amazed that that BBC content has made it to North Korea. I think it must all be about preserving the vegetable Wait, patch in your see... gulag. It could be ITV, <laughs> though, but someone somewhere in Britain is making money selling Alan Titchmarsh uh, <laughs> <Wait until, laughs> programmes to North Charlie Korea. Dinner. I wonder how she'll go down in North Korea. <laughs> uh, listen, thank you, you two, Rebecca Ryan and Ella Whelan. Fantastic company. Thank you very much. Coming up after the break, the Home Office has called a meeting of church leaders following the unveiling of documents relating to Clapham chemical attack at Abdul Azadi's asylum claim. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you are with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. 
They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good afternoon and welcome back to Cross Talk. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan and you are with Talk TV. On TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. And we are with you live from 1 until 3 p.m. every weekday. Coming up in this hour, the Home Secretary orders a meeting with church leaders after it is revealed that a judge granted asylum to the Clapham chemical attacker Abdul Azidi despite the fact he lied about his conversion to Christianity. And is Rishi Sunak's mini reshuffle too little, too late? It's so little you probably didn't even notice it. <laughs> the answer may be a big yes as the latest poll puts the Tories at their lowest rating since Liz Truss's disastrous foray into the country's finances. And when is a hot dog not a hot dog? Answer, when it's a cucumber. Comedian Ed Gamble replaces the offending sausage on an advert for his forthcoming tour after tube bosses in London ordered him to withdraw it over fears it could promote obesity. Of course it could. All that coming up, but first let's get the news headlines with the Dira Tudor. Good afternoon. Rishi Sunak's pledge to stop the boats has taken a serious blow. New Home Office figures show a record number of migrants have crossed the English Channel this year. 4,644 people have made the journey so far. This is the record for the first three months of a calendar year. 338 people arrived yesterday alone. Meanwhile, there are growing concerns of an ever-growing exodus from the Conservatives after two ministers quit yesterday. Robert Halvin became the 63rd politician to say he will not stand in the next election. He was joined by the Armed Forces Minister, James Heapy, who also resigned. It triggered a mini reshuffle for Rishi Sunak, chief political correspondent for The Times. Orbi Allegretti has told Talk Today that his days are numbered. You've got all sorts of candidates vying behind the scenes, people like Cammy Badnock, people like Grant Shapps. Uh, James Cleverley is a sort of dark horse. People don't talk about him as much, but he probably would be somebody who would go for it in the future as well. So all of that kind of manoeuvring and anticipation is already happening now. Over in Germany, at least five people have been killed in a coach crash. The Flixbus service was travelling from Berlin to Zurich on the busy A9 autobahn when it veered to the right and fell on its side. The re reports that others were injured. 
The search for six missing people after the Baltimore Bridge collapse has ended. Rescuers are presuming they're all dead. The Coast Guard suspended recovery efforts following the major incident yesterday, which saw a large cargo ship collide into one of the city's main crossings. Maryland Governor Wes Moore says it will be a while before things get back to normal. This is going to be a long-term journey for our state to recover. But if there's something that I know that has been on full display today, uh, we are Maryland tough and we are Baltimore strong. And we are going to make sure that as a state, we are going to get through this together. We are committed to getting through it together. And we will be in, uh, we will be in consistent and constant communication with the people of the state. Public satisfaction with the NHS has hit a new record low. A new survey found just one in four people were happy with services last year. Most said they were concerned about waiting times and staff shortages. And the Queen says Kate Middleton will be thrilled after well-wishers gave her posters to pass on to her. Her Majesty was meeting crowds at a farmer's market and promised them she will send their messages to Catherine. On Friday, the Princess of Wales revealed she is undergoing preventative chemotherapy for cancer. That's all from us now. Here's Nazanin Gaffer with your weather. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello, a real mixed bag of conditions out there this afternoon once again as we continue on the unsettled theme. We've seen rain across parts of the north and west this morning, as you can see on the earliest satellite and radar pictures, some heavy downpours across the southwest of England and Wales. And those outbreaks of rain are continuing to move further northwards, breaking up into showers as they do. Some more showery, lighter outbreaks across southern Scotland this afternoon, northern Scotland as well, wet and windy. And for parts of Northern Ireland, there will be sunshine and showers, as there will be across England and Wales later. Some of those showers are likely to be heavy and thundery, especially out towards parts of the west. Temperatures will be around average for the time of year, highs of around 10 to 12 degrees Celsius. Now, overnight, some of the showers continue across the west for a time, but they mostly fade away, and it will be a mainly dry and clear night across Scotland and Northern Ireland, far north of England, with a patchy frost. Meanwhile, across parts of England and Wales, there'll be yet more rain spreading northwards across many parts of central and southern areas of England and Wales, and wet and windy weather also spreading to Devon and Cornwall. Both these areas of rain will be spreading northwards through tomorrow. So throughout the day, it will be wet and it will be very windy, especially from the southwest. Temperatures will still be around average for the time of year as well. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Welcome back to the show. We have lots coming up over the next hour. We certainly do, don't we, Alex? We have lots to be getting uh, our teeth into today. We're going to be, of course, talking more about Azadi. Uh, but, I mean, let's focus in on this sort of uh, remarkable polling that 24% of people support the NHS. Yeah, what we're confused <laughs> about is not the fact that 75% uh, of the population say the NHS is useless. We are fascinated with the 25%, the one in the one in four, uh, who seem think to think it's, it's a great service. And where where have they the, been living? Well, I can't remember the last time I actually managed to speak to my GP's receptionist, let alone get an appointment with my GP. It's like telephone tombola. Yeah, I, last time I spoke to my uh, to doctor's receptionist, and she starts asking me all these questions about the nature of my cough and how long I've had it. And so, I, I mean, I suppose it was a bit facetious of me. I said, where did you get your medical degree? I mean, why are we getting telephonists? you're lucky to actually speak to yeah, a human I know, being. I, I, That's I, like winning the lottery. I think I was so overwhelmed by actually getting through <laughs> to a human being that I let it ride. But it is a bit ridiculous that, you know, doctors now, GPs in particular, seem to have surrounded themselves by, you know, thousands and thousands of mechanisms to make sure that... Uh, the patients never get to see them. Yeah, and the doctors, of course, are still going on strike, aren't they? The junior doctors. Of course they are. Sabre rattling for a 35% pay increase, which everyone knows nobody can afford, uh, given especially the huge waiting lists and the amount we're having to pay the private sector. Because they've gone on strike, it becomes a self fulfilling prophecy. And what's more, when these doctors are then called back to do overtime to try and catch up with the backlog that they created, they get more money. No. <laughs> So they know what they're doing. It is, uh, yeah, the NHS uh, will be dealing with this in just a little while, but uh, the front page of the Times today, 
one in four, uh, only one in four people are satisfied with the NHS. Who are those people? Why but, would you be satisfied with this shambles that's being imposed? But don't, don't worry, don't worry about the shambles that is the governance of this country because uh, Rishi Sunak has had a mini, mini micro reshuffle. You know, if you got the big microscope of the yeah. Large Hadron Collider that is there to see <laughs> the infinitesimal parts of atoms and whether or not they can be split, you still wouldn't notice that mini reshuffle. That's true, it is a micro reshuffle to say the least. But, uh, you know, as he searches for people to come into his cabinet following uh, the resignations of two members of we'll it... We'll be in it next. Uh, ...Robert Halfen and uh, James Heapy, uh, maybe he could go and get another one of those unelected sort of aristocrats oh, like... who uh, should we bring back? Well, like you Lord, know, uh, Lord Spade, Faith Osborne, and Sheeping, Lord, Lord, Lord Osborne. Oh, Lord Osborne. Lord Osborne of bring somewhere. Bring back. Yeah, we miss him, don't we? Blimey, that would be cockle warming. Yeah, yeah, the, the Cameron Osborne oh. axis back in action. That's what this country needs. But that's not <laughs> this country needs. That'd sort out all of our problems, uh, such as clearly huge problems in our asylum system, as it's been revealed today that Abdul Azidi uh, not only uh, had the Home Office marked on his application, we think you're lying about this whole Christianity thing, you can't even name the disciples, my friend. He was having to be escorted to church by this vicar sponsoring his application because he was a sex offender. <laughs> and yet he managed to stay. So we've been asking you, who is to blame for Azadi being granted asylum in the UK? Is it the church? Is it the judge? Is it the government? Give us a call, 0344 499 1000. Text us 8722, put talk in front of your message, or tweet us at Talk TV. And we have indeed had more and more of your texts and tweets coming in at this lunchtime. Brett says the whole system is stuffed, uh, but the buck stops with the government. Tanya writes, they all have authority, but are never held accountable or responsible. Janet's tweeted, they're all to blame, but the church needs to take a close look at itself. The judge had all the evidence telling him not to give Azadi permission to stay. And Christine says the government let him in in the first place, but the church took advantage. Well, let's get back to the top story now. And the Home Secretary has ordered a meeting with church leaders after it was revealed Clapham chemical attacker Abdul Azadi was granted asylum by a judge despite lying and failing a Christianity test. Files published yesterday show Azadi was allowed to stay in the UK after he claimed he had converted to Christianity and a now retired minister from Grange Road Baptist Church supported his application. Uh, the Home Office had rejected Azidi's claims for asylum based on his conversion, saying he'd used religion for his own ends. But an appeal court judge overturned this ruling in 2020. The documents also revealed the church knew about Azidi's sexual assault conviction and had even restricted his attendance to services and ensured he was always accompanied by two male members. Uh, with us now is former Scotland Yard and Met Police detective Peter Blexley. Uh, we should remember, Peter, uh, at uh, the centre of all of this, is had our asylum system worked properly, and of course we said to a convicted sex offender, you uh, committed sexual assault while in our country, uh, you're out of here. Uh, had our system have worked properly, uh, and he was not allowed to stay, uh, a woman wouldn't be fighting for his, her sight in South London and two kids wouldn't be traumatised by this uh, uh, monster who came and threw alkaline at them. Uh, we allowed this guy to stay because our migrant system, our asylum system, frankly, is in the toilet. And that poor woman will be scarred for life. We must remember that children were injured in the incident as were a number of police officers and members of the public who heroically ran to their aid when they heard this horrific event for unfolding. But it's a great privilege to be able to sit here and to speak on behalf of Brett and Janet and Christine and so many other people, viewers and listeners, who messaged in in the first hour of your show and almost entirely nailed it. Because, of course, a government's sole or major responsibility, I should say, yeah. is to protect its citizens. Yeah. And in this case, the government, the immigration judges, the church and whoever else played any part in allowing that repeat sex offending monster to stay in this country has blood on their hands. 
Yeah, do you know, Peter, one thing that I think needs to be discussed, and I've brought this up regularly today off the back of this, is, you know, who is the person who has suffered at the end of all of that incompetence or uh, blind ignorance or willful, uh, you know, ignoring the threat of this man? It is the woman. She's the one in the hospital who's lost her eyes. Um, and when you look at crime statistics from other countries, which I do, because we've covered them all up here, we don't publish this stuff anymore, but when you look at crime statistics from Western European countries, there is a direct connection between people who have come into the country in recent years and uptick in certain crimes, in particular sexual offences. Now, I don't know what your experience is in this department as a police officer, why these statistics aren't being published and whether or not that is the case here in Britain. But I think it's high time, given what's happened to the victim of Abdullah Zaidi, that we do start talking about this. There are so many people who are employed in what I regard as kind of non-job jobs, who are part of the blob, who don't want to confront the uncomfortable truths about crime, about immigration and about other things that are so wrong in this country, I believe actively seek to try and suppress this information. We have murderers sitting in our jails now who came to this country illegally. We've had other asylum seekers that have come to this country and committed murder and many other serious crimes. If people want to check out what I'm saying, mm. then simply go online and choose your particular nationality, then put asylum seeker behind it, then put convicted in there, and wait and see how many results come up detailing how many cases of people arrested, convicted and sent to prison. Clearly, Azidi should have been deported. He should not have been allowed to stay uh, the moment he broke our laws in any way. But uh, in terms of his offence being sexual, a sexual assault, uh, that's really, really serious and he should have been kicked out. But for whatever reason, he wasn't. What about the way we treat sex offenders generally? Given that he was convicted of sexual assault, why was he walking the streets anyway? Why don't we send these people to prison? He was convicted not only of sexual assault, but he was also convicted on another occasion of indecently exposing himself to use the vernacular, flashing, masturbating. Now, let me name another couple of rather more notorious criminals who started their criminality with indecently exposing themselves and then went on to commit far more serious sexual offences. Colin Pitchfork. There's a name that's been in the yeah. press recently. Mm -hmm. Granted parole, only for that to be revoked when he proved to be, yet again, misbehaving. A man who raped and murdered separately two teenagers. And another person of considerable notoriety whose criminality started with indecent exposure, Wayne Cousins, yeah. kidnapper, rapist and murderer of Sarah Everard, rest her soul. Indecent exposure is an escalation crime. Mm -hmm. It is so often a gateway to far more serious offending. And in the years that I served as a detective and being a police and crime commentator since, I don't know of anybody who was convicted of indecent assault, uh, sorry, of indecent exposure, then decided to put their certain parts away, reform and not offend or have a perverted thought or deed thereafter. Yeah. It's a dangerous, dangerous crime. So just to uh, recap, we've got to look at the way we uh, treat sex offenders. We've been too lenient on them, aren't we? Without a shadow of a doubt. Yet again, women, so often, overwhelmingly, the victims of sex offenders. And women are getting a really, really harsh deal yeah. in this country and further afield these days, whether it be through sex offenders not being convicted, mm -hmm. and we know how minuscule the convictions are for rape, for example, mm -hmm. about assaults going on on public transport, in public spaces that are not reported, because women are going, what's, what's the, the point? point? Yeah. Please, please do report it. I urge you, I beg you to report it. And further matters that hugely affect the wonderful women of this nation, like transgender, shared spaces well, yeah. and the such like. It, what do you this, think, this Alex? Is, what are you... Because you talked talk about this this morning. This is such an important issue for me because I've been living in London for 10 years. I've also lived in multiple other countries around the world. Never before have I felt as unsafe as I do now. When I walk down the street, I'm increasingly being leered at. I'm increasingly having... Tss, tss, 
I'm increasingly being followed, like I'm going around the souks of Morocco. And it's not visibly to me anyway, people who were born and bred here. It isn't, and I, I, you know, it's very difficult because we're not allowed to talk about it because, oh my gosh, you know, that's not, that breaks taboo. Oh, you know, you're a racist if you say this. I'm sorry, a lot of women going about their daily business feel that their safety is being directly threatened by people who are coming from different cultures. And this needs to be discussed because I've had enough, all my other female friends have had enough. When I put this stuff online, the number of comments online from other women saying they've had enough and saying thank you for talking about this. Was it not enough when we noticed what was going on with grooming gangs? Was it not enough when we see what's happened to the victim of Abdul Azadi? When are we going to have the conversation that women's safety is being mortgaged at the altar of mass immigration and this faux political correctness? And well, I speak to many just... other women who just... suffer the same indignities and offences like you do, who don't have a public profile, yeah. who are not in the media, and they are echoing what you are saying Thank you. about the utterly unacceptable behaviour that they are being subjected to and I keep urging them to report it. And, of course, it is an indisputable fact that there are cultures in other countries in this world where women are treated as second, third, yeah. fourth, fifth-class citizens, where behaviour towards them is utterly abhorrent and unacceptable. And, sadly, when you import a number of people from cultures such as that, it comes as no surprise, and the proof is there that some of that unacceptable behaviour towards women has been deeply, regrettably imported. Uh, yeah. By the way, uh, yesterday the Taliban, uh, Taliban chief in Afghanistan announced uh, the return of stoning women for adultery. So that's very special. I think it's only fair to point out that uh, I'm, you know, I'm not in any way trying to undermine what you're saying, Alex, but uh, obviously uh, white British men uh, people are also sex uh, yeah, sex I mean, And for balance, yeah. I named both Colin Pitchfork yeah. and Wayne exactly. Cousins. Exactly, but what I want to know is where are the crime statistics? Because when I look at the ones coming out of Sweden, when I look at the ones coming out of Denmark, when I look at the ones coming out of Germany, they are telling me a really alarming story and what I think this government needs to do is look into our crime statistics here who are committing these offenses is there a trend is it per capita based upon certain people coming from certain cultures an increase I don't know show us the receipts because this is women's safety in question I don't care if this isn't politically correct what is the correct thing to do is stand up for the women in your own country that is what we need to have happen if only our government knew who was in our country but well, they don't because so many problem. people have come here illegally and are off the radar no. But I'm sick of hearing, uh, to just sort of go back to the foundation stone of this discussion, uh, I'm sick of hearing, oh, well, our jails are so crowded, you know, we can't send people to jail. If you, if you assault, sexually assault a yeah. woman, I, no ifs, no buts, you go to jail. And I would include flashing in that. Oh, well, it, 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 decent exposure is it, it, a, a gateway. It's a clear, clear indicator of a deeply perverted troubled mind who so often goes on to commit further, more more serious offences. Yes, of course, we will have the hand-wringing liberal elite telling you that the jails are full, we lock up more people than anywhere else in Europe, so we shouldn't be locking more people up. I've had the misfortune to debate against some with some of these people. Utter nonsense. We've got around about 10% of our jails are full of foreign offenders. Mm give or take some percentage points either way. Again, let's have some accurate statistics because we will know who's in the jails about nation of origin, culture of origin and the such like. Then there can be some informed research into just what we are importing onto the streets of Britain. If indeed it proves conclusively, and I'm sure it will, that some cultures that we would shun and would have want nothing to do with yeah. are coming into this country. I will always remember those news reports about what happened in Cologne, in that square on New Year's Eve, and how quickly all the authorities rushed to try and suppress any anecdotal evidence that what had happened were a lot of men from other cultures surrounding the German girls and making their lives extremely difficult that night. Yeah, well, I just say... The, the rush to shut people up on it. There's the, 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 there are... Basically, no worse crimes, in my uh, view. Uh, I mean, maybe murder, but, uh, you know, sexually impose... A man sexually imposing themselves on a woman that doesn't 
consent is an extremely serious crime, whether it be full rape or just a groping session. And I think we should throw the book at them, uh, including people like uh, Abdul Azidi. Uh, if, we, if the punishment doesn't fit the crime, then our justice system mm. is a joke. This is a terrible crime, sexual assault, and the punishments we are dishing out do not fit that crime. And we have insufficient deterrence throughout the criminal justice system. Yeah, yeah. The government recognised that we needed more prison spaces when they announced a prison building plan in 2020. Some of those may come online next year or the year after. Others are held up through planning issues. Because, of course, MPs will go on the telly and say, yes, build more prisons. Then when a planning application goes in for one in their constituency, oh, no. all of a sudden, they're not quite so keen on that, <laughs> are they? No. We need more prisons. We need more prison capacity. The nonsense people from the 80s said we had a prison population half this side haven't taken into account the increase in population, the increase in crime, and don't let anybody tell you that crime's decreasing because that's yeah, a nonsense. That's the true. reporting of crime is just not happening because nobody thinks anything will happen. And we need more prison capacity. Thank you so well much, said, Peter. Peter. Now, your texts and tweets have been coming in thick and fast this lunchtime. We were asking who's to blame for Azadi being granted asylum in the UK? Church, judge or government? Richard says, all three. Now prosecute those responsible. It's the only way these clowns will get the message. Karen writes, the judge. They are there to scrutinise the evidence. The evidence was really quite overwhelming, but he still granted asylum. It's a failure of duty, in my opinion. I agree with Karen. I do too. And Robert says, all of them need holding to account for the act of treason. I think it's the act of utter useless incompetence, uh, but uh, well said. Uh, the J And James has tweeted, all of them have the same ideology, so I'd say it's a joint <laughs> effort. <laughs> yeah, that kind of... That's quite that good, it. actually, yeah. Now, coming up after the break, Rishi Sunak suffers another blow as two Tory ministers quit government, forcing a micro-miniature cabinet <laughs> reshuffle. I'm Alex Phillips. I'm micro-miniature Kevin O'Sullivan, <laughs> and you are with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And you're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> that, that oh, a, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. 
The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips. And this is Crosstalk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has been forced into a mini micro miniature cabinet reshuffle <laughs> following the shock exit of two more Tory ministers. Skill minister, skills Minister Robert Halford. Didn't know there was one of those. Yeah, yeah, so what skills? What uh, became the 63rd Tory MP to quit cabinet yesterday, uh, shortly after Defence Minister James Heapy handed in his resignation. I'm not sure he's the 63rd cabinet minister. And also, he's when you the 63rd MP. Grant Shapps is the Defence Secretary, so Heapy's something in that department, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, you know, yeah, I don't know yeah. what these micro positions are. Now, with local elections looming, the Conservatives could stand to lose up to 500 seats. But the bad news doesn't end there. New polling puts the Tories at their lowest rating since, I don't know, two minutes ago. <laughs> uh, and also since Liz Truss's disastrous mini budget. The numbers also show there is now a 99% chance of Labour forming the next administration. Yeah. So, can Sunak... Turn it around. No, let's go. Well, Easter miracles, <laughs> you never know. For more on this, we're joined by former government advisor, friend of this programme, Charlie Rowley. Charlie, I mean, you know, I, I love looking at the polling because I'm seeing glorious things such as from the 2019 people who backed the Conservative Party, if you split that into gender, the men now back reform more than they do Conservative Party. And if you split that into the Red Wall, they also back reform more than the Conservative Party. I mean, it's time to just throw in the towel, isn't it? <laughs> well, good afternoon. Um, uh, not at all, because um, there are many, many months to go uh, until the next general election, until the Prime Minister will call that election. Uh, we all suspect it'll be in the autumn, uh, in October. Uh, and, you know, when you're seeing the economy improve, when you're seeing inflation coming down, when you're seeing uh, the economy start to grow, when you see those flights take off, uh, one of his key uh, pledges to uh, get uh, the Rwanda policy off the, off the table, when he makes those cuts in terms of the waiting list, in terms of the NHS, people will have a second look at Rishi Sunak and they'll think he's done uh, uh, a good Charlie, enough job just, to reward just him with a, make sure. a second term. I just want to make sure the producer got this right. You weren't booked for the bit we're doing for comedy at the end of the programme. That's someone else. You are supposed to be being serious in this. <laughs> Well, look, I genuinely believe, um, uh, look, as you get closer to a general election, that pe the polls will narrow anyway. And uh, the public will be very, very uh, clear um, and understanding that there will only be one person that could become prime minister. It'll either be Rishi Sunak or Sakir Starmer. So you've either got to vote Conservative or Labour. Vote for any other political party, whether it's the Lib Dems, whether it's the Greens, uh, whether it's uh, Reform, who I you give you credit uh, Alex are, are, are upping uh, their poll rating, uh, as you say. But the choice will be very, very clear. It's either Rishi Sunak or, or Sakir Starmer who will be the next prime minister. And it's a very clear choice that the public will have to make. And um, uh, I think given that choice, it will make the public think very hard as to who they're going to vote for. And that could lead to, um, uh, as I say, the Conservatives... Uh, hanging on to power. Uh, last week, uh, Charlie, we had the doyen, the guru of pollsters as a guest, Sir John Curtis. We pushed him hard. He said that Rishi was up against it. Uh, he didn't stand a particularly good chance at the next election, but he wouldn't go further than that. Today, it has emerged, he now says, uh, that there is a 99% chance that uh, Sunak will lose the election and Starmer will win. Uh, are you really going to sort of grab hold of that 1% and say everything's still to play for? You've got to admit, Charlie, it is looking very, very grim for Rishi and the gang, isn't it? Well, it's looking very difficult. Um, you're, <laughs> yeah. you're absolutely right. Why did they um, ever get... You uh... should be an advisor to this day. Your loyalty <laughs> is just breathtaking. But carry on, Charlie. <laughs> 
<laughs> I think the um, my 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 camera work is also yeah we're, 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 yeah, we're noting that as well. Hang up on us. Oh, oh, no, hanging on, hanging on, <laughs> clinging on like the government. Um, but um, <laughs> I think um, uh, I think look, you know, uh, whenever there is a, a chance, it means that there's a chance. Uh, and um, as I say, look, with the polls, the way that they're going, uh, the locals would be very, very difficult. The locals are always difficult for an incoming uh, uh, sitting government. Um, so we'll just have to wait and see what happens on uh, the 3rd of May, Friday the 3rd of May, when we will wake up to those results that take place on the 2nd. Um, and, uh, you know, there will be another autumn statement. I'm sure there'll be another economic event that makes sure that there are tax cuts that are taking place that can really sort of Put the rocket boosters up the UK economy to turbocharge growth, uh, all things that people want to see, all things that Conservative voters want to see. Uh, and, and something that's in the uh, manifesto for the general election, uh, something for everybody, for red wall seats to hang on to that red wall in the north of England, for those Conservative constituencies in the south. And uh, that will be the, um, uh, the a strategy that I would pursue if I was still in government advising um, uh, uh, the Tory party. Now, one thing that uh, I would uh, suggest to you, and something Kevin and I were talking about earlier, is they seem to be hemorrhaging MPs, uh, not just standing in the next election, but also from Cabinet, uh, to the rate at which I'm sort of worried there won't be enough bums on seats by the time it comes right into the next election. So in the spirit of Easter and uh, resurrection, uh, obviously Lord Spadeface of Sheeping Norton <laughs> was brought back from the dead. Uh, who do you think should be anointed as a Lord of the Realm in, the, in, in, in Rishi's Cabinet? Um, you and Kevin. Oh, well, of you course, us. Kevin. We were saying George Osborne. Why not get the <laughs> band not, back yeah, together, right? Eh? back. Well, I think, um, uh, look, you know, uh, Don't anyone, say yes. that served, <laughs> any, any, anyone that served and uh, is still, um, you know, able to serve it should, should do so. And I think, look, um, Theresa May is obviously stepping down. She's announced that she's not going to stand again as an MP, so she could be elevated to a, um, a, 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 a Baroness May. Um, I'm sure she'll be out on the campaign trail, just as uh, David Cameron will, just as Boris Johnson will, um, uh, just as Rishi Sunak obviously will be leading that campaign. I think... Um, will Liz Truss uh, be out on the campaign trail, do you reckon? Liz Truss? Yeah, will she be joining them? Um, uh, I, I, do you know what? Um, whether she's invited to or not, I'm sure she will. Um, she will be there. <laughs> Um, I do think Liz is one to shy away from the limelight at the minute, so I'm sure she'll be there in some capacity, yes. Uh, Charlie, uh, you, you, oh. you, you, your uh, capacity for sticking up for this uh, doomed government, as I say, is astonishing. <laughs> It's always a pleasure we to have you optimism. on board. We thought to ourselves, who can we get on that would actually <laughs> Not, say Rishi who's the might, only person who would come might on? stand a chance? <laughs> I know. Face. Charlie Rowley, uh, good oh, to talk to you as Charlie. always, mate. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Not that I want it, but maybe it should be me going into the Lords after that performance. Yeah, there you go, Absolutely. there you go. You Definitely deserve you. it. Lord, arise, Lord Rowley. Yeah, the, the new skills minister. Yeah, there, you go. Yes, <laughs> yes, there you go. Uh, but not camera uh, work. Yeah, not yeah. camera work. Yeah, no camera <laughs> skills, but apart from that. Uh, thank you very much, Charlie. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, next, public satisfaction with the NHS is at a record low, according to findings from a long-running poll. Research by British Social Attitudes has revealed that just one in four people were happy with services in 2023, with poor access to GPs and waiting times stated as the biggest source of deepening frustration. Well, joining us now is former NHS... NHS Trust Chair Martin Gower. Martin, great to have you on the programme. I mean, what is going on here? Yes, we can point the finger at the pandemic and how that has hugely extended waiting lists. Yes, we can point the finger at the junior doctors being on strike, but the problems in the NHS have been going on for a very, very long time. What's the solution? Well, I think the solution is that the system nationally doesn't work. Um, but if we look at the, the issues that have been raised, the, the shortage of staff has been mentioned by people who responded to the survey. Um, it takes too long to get a GP or hospital appointment. That has been also uh, raised as a, as a major issue. And I think it, it's not everywhere. I heard you earlier saying, you know, who, who are the 27% who, who, who are happy with the NHS? Well, I'm in one of them actually, purely by luck, uh, because where I live, we have excellent services, and I can't say otherwise, both in the terms of response times, the GPs, acute hospital, etc. However, the culture generally in the NHS is awful. 
Um, and why do people not work effectively in any organization? It can be to do with money, of course, but more often than not, it's just not a very nice place to work. And I think we've got that cultural issue. We've also, and I think this is true of a lot of the public sector at the moment, there is a lack of concentrated focus on what needs to be done. Um, and, and, and I use the word focus because the peripheral things, the things that are kind of nice to do, um, it, 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 it's good, you know, a lot of corporations are doing it, a bit of virtue signaling, et cetera, et cetera. I think those things really need to be quite parked in the NHS at the moment. Finally, I think the other issue which we will always have, and it's not been great in my very, very long lifetime, is that um, it's run kind of by politicians who don't hang around very long. Um, I think we've had 38 secretaries of state or health ministers since the NHS was founded in 1948. They come, they go, some are good, some are poor, some are a bit complacent. Some do a reasonably good job, but to have them run the NHS run by politicians, we're just seeing what's wrong. I don't think it made much difference whoever was in power, to be honest. I was going to say, Martin, I mean, uh, government after government, health secretary after health secretary, uh, vow to sort the NHS out, we'll reorganise it, we'll reshuffle it from uh, root to root and branch Risha, all this stuff, uh, work out how we spend the money. West Streeting, uh, the uh, potential next health secretary for Labour, is actually making noises, saying, you know, we shouldn't have so many sacred cows, there may be areas we should privatise, etc. So of all parties, it's Labour who uh, seem to be accepting maybe a change of direction is uh, in order. But, uh, uh, I mean, th th this is the problem, isn't it? That, that, that politicians... They think it's good for their careers, it's good for their parties to call the NHS amazing, to tell that barefaced lie that the NHS is the envy of the world. And unless we can get rid of that attitude, unless we can get government in or a health secretary in who wants to be realistic and say the problem with the NHS is not not enough money, the problem with the NHS is how it spends that money. Kevin, it's definitely not that they haven't got enough money. They've got more money. You know, we're, we're spending 11.6% of GDP at the moment. We're up there with all the major European health systems. Um, but let's not forget, there is what, who, whether it's Wes Streeting, Jeremy Hunt, whoever else is there, the NHS management have a wonderful way of diluting things. In other words, we're going to, the plan is to do this, this and this, and they do a bit of it enough to sort of keep everybody off their backs. But actually, what they don't really do is do it in a really radical way. And that's one been one of the problems. Um, it's fine for health secretary saying, oh, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we, we're going to change this, change that. Actually, it, the, 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 bear in mind, the NHS is the fourth largest employer in the world. Um, I think they're sandwiched between Walmart uh, globally and Amazon globally and the, the ones above them are the Indian Army, the Chinese Army and the American Defence. Um, so it's a massive, massive organisation and that's really what the problem is with it actually. Um, the, the, it, it's very easy for people to say, well, you know, health secretaries, they come and go, I wonder who'll be next, you know, let's run a book on it. And I'm actually told not that the health secretaries who are appointed see it as a great opportunity, but actually, when the prime minister is forming his cabinet, I've been told some years back by a cabinet minister that they dreaded that the appointment they might be made to ask to make to do was the health secretary's job, that it was basically a poison chalice. You can see where they're coming from, can't you? <laughs> Most of the jobs these days are a poison chalice. How, how about this, Martin? You know, right off the bat, uh, I believe that there are three thousand five hundred unmedically qualified middle managers at the NHS on £100,000 or more. They, the NHS needs, in my view, as a matter of urgency, to look into what each and every one of these people are actually doing for this money. And um, while we're at it, let's see how much the NHS is spending on diversity, how much it is spending on literature, uh, which excludes the word woman, uh, we'll call them people with cervixes, etc., etc. The 
waste of money is off the scale, and that's what needs to be addressed very, very quickly. Would you agree? I agree. This is what I was talking about, the peripherals. So these are things that are not core to their, their mission at the moment is to get the waiting list down, um, concentrate entirely on patient care, and, of course, avoiding the necessity for people to come in hosp into hospital where possible. Here's a couple of things from me. £10 a visit to go to the GP. The GPs will tell you how stressed out and overworked they are, but they'll also tell you that 40% of the people in their waiting rooms needn't be seeing a GP. Um, but if, if, if that is the case, then there's a job that the gut, this one job the government does have to do is to educate people that actually there may be other solutions to their health challenges than I'm going to see the doctor. As I had to learn when I lived in America, when, when I tried to make an appointment with the doctor when I had a bad back, I was told, no, you don't need to see a doctor. You need to see one of our physical therapists, which was what happened to me. But, you know, it, it's it's. There's, a, there's an educational job to do. £10 to go and see a GP. I bet that would take the waiting list at GPs down. Yeah. Uh, is that, are you sort of suggesting that the model we have in the UK, because I'm glad you said this, because having uh, lived in Belgium for a number of years, what you're suggesting is what happens in Belgium if you want to go for a cardiograph, you go to um, the cardiologist. If you have a problem with your back, you go to the physiotherapist, you go to the osteopath. You don't need to go to the GP first. But in, in the UK system, everything filters through general practitioners. Do you think it's time we looked at that model and said, this isn't working? It doesn't work. It doesn't work. I mean, but I have grandchildren who live in America. They, when they're not well, uh, they, they, they see a community pediatrician. Uh, they don't go to a place where there are everybody from very, very elderly grandparents through to tiny babies, all in this sort of waiting room place, waiting to see the doctor, um, that you go quickly to a specialist. I know that in France, um, where I had a home at one time, uh, patients were referred from their um, primary care service straight in to see a consultant uh, get some scans done the same day and i heard of somebody who actually uh, was who'd been in pain with with his hip actually got his hip replacement done that week but there was no sending all these letters out and and and, and you know saying would you please come to report to the outpatients at this time when actually they hadn't even checked if you were going to be on holiday or away mm. or couldn't do it that day you know there, there's a whole lot of things there that that just don't work they've it's not that changed enough yeah. and the government no government will change it the only way they will change it is by allowing local services to work together to change it yeah. and i think that is a bit of what i'm seeing locally where i live i'm very very lucky but i think there is a little bit more of that needs to happen it's not about it's not about saying we will do this it's about saying you sort it. Mm. You know, there's no such thing as being nationally ill, is there? Yeah. No. Yeah. You know, it's a local issue. Yeah. And we all judge the NHS by the services we, re we receive in the local area where we live. Yeah. GPs, uh, just open your doors, let patients get to you. We've got to spare a thought for these uh, local doctors. They're uh, p paying for those force fields to keep patients away from their surgeries is very expensive. Uh, Martin, great to talk to you as always. Thank you so much for your time. Now, we have a caller on the line on this topic, Annie from Stockport. What are your thoughts on the NHS, Annie? Annie, it's, sorry, it's, it's absolutely disgusting. I want to talk about the appointment system. Now, I have been trying to get an appointment with cardiac rehab after having a heart attack. I've had one appointment, can't get another. So I've tried, I've tried, I've tried, and then I lost my rag yesterday. I phoned them up, and the crucial of the matter is... They've given me one tomorrow, and they've been trying to contact me, but the rules are they cannot leave a message on the answer phone. Hang on. Why not? Why oh, not, really Annie? Why? Stupid. I don't know. <laughs> and second, just uh, skip, let me just finish, Kev. Yeah, please. Uh, and secondly, I had an appointment cause it was COPD. I had an appointment with my consultant who wanted to see me within six months. It is ten months. I phone up, I'm told, oh, you're the back of the queue. I said, well, what are you talking about? She said, I've got to go back to my doctor. Oh, wait a minute. I've got to go back to my doctor and ask him to make an appointment with the consultant to see me. So what is going on? Yeah, this is this is what I hear all the time. This sort of fast and what we were talking about earlier, that everything has to go back through the GP. It's some sort of filtration system before you can get to where you need to go. Other. 
Do you know, I remember I, I came back from France with a broken thumb having fallen off a mountain and was told <laughs> in France, well, when you get home, you're going to need the cast on your hand changed. So yeah. I phoned the GP after about three days I managed to get through and they said, no, 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 you've got to phone that NHS 111 line, whatever it's called. So I yeah, phoned yeah. them and they said, phone the GP. Back and forth I went and was told to go to A&E. Waited yeah. about 12 hours in A&E and they said, what are you doing here? So, you know. So, Annie, uh, I'm going to summarise what you think about the NHS. Tell me if I'm wrong. Well, I, all, I, all you're I, asking I, I is work, uh, to be NHS. able to get to see a doctor, right? I worked for the NHS for 30 years. I mean, I'm 85 now, and this, it, it, honestly, I, I don't know what's up with it. And I'd like to know who these pillocks are that are, that are telling the appointments clerk who could have an appointment. And I am not going back to my doctor to say, I don't want to waste my time, I'm out of breath, I don't want to go, to say, well, you write to the consultant. It's pretty ridiculous. You should have seen me uh, four months ago. It's like ten months now. Really and, sorry to hear that, Annie, but uh, really good to uh, talk to you. You sum up exactly yeah. what's wrong with the NHS. Excellent call. Please call us again. Now, coming up after the break, comedian Ed Gamble has been forced to change a tube poster that featured an unhealthy hot dog Ooh. because it falls foul of this London Underground's healthy eating rules. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you are with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, did fail to, her. Yeah, we're supposed it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and this is Crosstalk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. 
Now, comedian Ed Gamble has been forced to alter an advert for his upcoming tour after TfL bosses raised concerns it could promote obesity. The original poster showed the podcast star eating a hot dog, which he was forced to replace with a cucumber. And it isn't the first time Tube bosses have cracked down on junk food-related ads. Last year, posters promoting the West End show Tony and Tina's Wedding were banned because they featured the main characters on top of a wedding cake. Well, joining us now is comedian Mike McLean. Mike, the nanny state's gone way too far, hasn't it? I mean, this, these posters weren't even advertising food. I, I was actually um, on the tube the other day and I saw that poster and uh, I didn't immediately think, oh, got to get that rid of, get rid of that photograph. It's going to make me want to eat 20 hot dogs put on weight. I just thought, well, clever poster. Uh, indeed, and he's replaced it with a cucumber now. Uh, but the, what's funny is, so he's got this uh, apron on, which is full of mustard and ketchup and everything. So there's a cucumber there <laughs> with a load of kind of hot dog condiments all over him. So it's kind of bizarre now. But uh, what I'd ask you, <laughs> Mike, uh, I know you're not from uh, London, but you come down here a lot. So you're from Manchester, we know that. Big City fan. Did you know, by the way, Mike and I got taught how to uh, have etiquette once. We'll come back to that. Have etiquette? Well, you know, how to behave with <laughs> etiquette. For did me. We, did. Did we went for, a, week. We went for a weekend in Scotland to learn how to speak properly and how to say... Well, they didn't you know. teach that first it, yeah. very well, it, did they? We both failed the course. <laughs> However, Mike, you're down in London Completely. a lot. Uh, what the hell has obesity got to do with Transport for London, the Mayor's uh, Transport Department? It's, it's got nothing, Kevin, and this is the thing that really, really gets my goal. It's one person's opinion who is actually speaking for everybody else. So he's, basically, he's seen that picture and gone, do you know what? I think that's going to cause obesity. I'm going to speak on behalf of everybody else, and I want to get rid of that. And to me, that's just complete ignorance. Nobody, I can't imagine, I, I don't, I'd put a £1,000 on it, Kev, that nobody has gone into, into the tube, seen that picture, and thought, oh, no. That's going to offend somebody. And that is the thing with comedy today, Ken. There's, there's, there's these hands that are literally going around in killing comedy. They're literally killing comedy. And I can imagine Ed getting that phone call and just going absolutely crazy. But I also think he'll probably have got another 20 minutes for that show out of that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's comedy in itself, actually. You could, I think the first person <laughs> to script a comedy based upon this sort of stuff would probably have a best selling show. Yeah. Well, he will now. I'll probably sell out now. Yeah. And if I was going to see that show, I'd get everybody to come with um, cucumbers. Um, and, and do you know what? It's like your Annie said in that last caller. Whoever made that decision is just a pillock. Absolute first class. In fact, could you... I'd send him two tickets to come and see the show and then spend the 20 minutes just roasting him. I'd put him right on the front row and then literally have the original poster uh, and then just... And I'd go to town on him. Yeah, I, I mean, next time you've got a show in London, Mike, you know what to do. Put a, make a poster with a bloody great sort of a breakfast fry up on it or something. Sadiq Khan will ban it, gonna... and then everyone will be talking about you, and your show will be a sellout. How about that? But that's the that's the thing, Kev, is that we now in this country we're just trying to please everybody, and we're actually pleasing nobody. Yeah, and, that, and that's good point. the thing, you know. And, I did, a, I did a gig the other week, I did this joke that, and it was 300 people. And I did this one joke and everybody laughed. This woman came to me at the end, she said, oh, I like your routine, I like your set. I said, oh, thank you. I think you should take that last joke out. Now, normally you'd go, all right, okay, and move on and not. But I said to her why, and she told me, and I said, look, let me think about this. If I take that one joke, there's 200, 300 people in there, 299 people found that joke funny. But the one person that didn't find it funny was you. Yeah. And you want me to take that joke out so the next time I do another show, I have to take that joke out so three, 299 people, 300 people are not going to see that or hear that joke because of you. So you're speaking on behalf of everybody. Yeah, it's, it's... Uh, and then I tell her what to do. Exactly right. I mean, the, the point is a lot of good jokes are based around offence. You know, I often think if somebody's not offended, it's probably not funny. Exactly. But you are, Mike. Uh, great to talk to you, mate. Thank, thank you, you so much. Mike McLean there. Uh, sadly, you. though, Alex, we've come to the end of the show. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Please do join us same time tomorrow, 9.30 a.m. Up next, there is Ian Collins, and it's goodbye from us. Have a good afternoon.
independent republic of Mike Graham. Weeknights at 8 on Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, Oi, oi, treat, go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> 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 